I couldn't really go and say, I was offered that first. You know? <laughs> um, so I thought, well, the only way I can tell people I was offered it is by accepting it. So that's what I did. And that's, that's my story. Well, um, like Peter, I was a massive fan of the, uh, of the programme when I was younger, outside, until I was about sort of 11 when it stopped being on television together. I was obsessed by it. And um, so when I, it came back to television in 2005, and that was just, you know, just when I was, yeah, when I was about to leave drama school. Um, and so I thought, oh, I'd love to be on Doctor Who, it would be great. And I think I gave my agent a bit of a prod, sort of saying, could you get me on Doctor Who or something? And I was like, oh, leave it with us. And it happened to be Bodger this timing because they were going to bring the Sontarans back. Uh, not that I knew anything about that, but I think they, they might have even cast Chris Ryan first. But I think they definitely made a decision that they were going to make them quite small. And Chris Ryan is even smaller than me. Um, and he did a full body cast, you know, so he laid out in a puddle of plaster and they sort of made a whole Sontaran suit out of it. So then they went, okay, he's five foot tall. Anybody else playing Sontara? That's they, they gave himself a bit, a bit to a bit to chew off. So I'm five foot two, and th that clearly was a point in my favour. Um, so yeah, and then the night my agent said, "Oh, you've got a little Doctor Who," and um, I sort of gave them, <laughs> let the card slip from my chest slightly. When uh, I, I got, it's an alien. It's called something like called, Is it Sontaran? So I, um, I don't know, darling. Uh, <laughs> so um, yes, I did, but, uh, showed myself not, not to be that cool in that way. But yeah, I went to the audition. And um, they said, oh, did you watch the programme? I was like, yes, yes, I have watched it just a bit. Because I was able to um, get my old VHS tape of the, uh, the Time Warrior here, of John Pertwee's first sort of uh, Sontara story, which I got for Christmas when I was about 11 or something like that. So it felt like I'd done about 30 years' worth of research. Before I actually <laughs> it. And then, yeah, and then I sort of like, yeah, learned the script. And it, I, think, see, I, I, think, I did two readings. The first one was quite sort of like, OK, I'm just going to sort of like show them like an act. So it was like a straight one. And so, like, you know, just to, like, going through all the emotions and all that sort of thing. And then I went, okay, that's nice, good. Could you make it a bit more, uh, alien? <laughs> well, how far can I go with this? <laughs> so I turned on the full alien. And, and uh, they sort of, like, they clearly liked it rather than sort of, uh, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't too embarrassing. So, uh, yeah, and then, and then I, yeah, a couple of weeks later, my agent said, you've got the part, and then I jumped around the room giggling for about 10 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> And they've clearly got a rubber suit that only fits me, so they keep inviting me back, so that's nice. Did you know before that it would be a recurring character? No, not at all. I mean, obviously the Sultarans were a kind of like a, were a, were a baddie that came back several times in the old series. But so at least, yeah, just the fact that I was in a double episode was great. And then when the script for A Good Man Goes to War came along and had this character of Strax, I thought, ah, that's not just a Sultaran. I know that I can do that well. Because that's, that's it's really, it's a you know, beautifully written part. And, He's a very economically different part. So when we were on screen together, with, when I'm on screen with Lee McIntosh and, and Catherine Stewart, we're on the path of not again. Neve will have pages and pages of very technical exposition to get through and explaining the plot and all the scientific jargon. And then I'll have one line at the end of the scene, which is a joke, and people will remember that. So, <laughs> so yeah, yes. In many ways, Neve works a lot harder than I do. Now, I guess you're both in a good position to compare the vintage Newton. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the main differences are, and are there maybe things from the old movie that you miss now, or things that you wish you had back then? Um, well, there's there several differences. Of course, the, 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 the most important, like, the thing I'm most envious of, I suppose, is the, is the special effects. So in my day, you just didn't have them. Yeah. You didn't have compute. We didn't have computers that could do stuff like that. We literally had green screen, and that was about it. And uh, of course, the budget, when it came back, it came back it, uh, as a sort of prestigious show. In my day, it was, uh, it was sold to 39 countries and made the BBC a lot of money, but it was not considered uh, one of the top rated shows in, uh, in the BBC's mind. Um, so it was great when it, when it came back. Of course, it came back under the auspices of Russell T. Davis and then Stephen Moffat, who uh, you couldn't get bigger Doctor Who fans than those two, really. And so I think the quality. I mean, the quality when I was doing it, the writing was mixed, I think. Some very good stories, but some very dodgy stories as well, because they were just written by, they weren't written by devotees of sci-fi, or yeah. they were just written by you know, writers who might one day write a softly, softly, or a casualty, and then they knock off a you know, Doctor Who. Now I think the great thing is that the series are really written by fans of the genre, and I think that means that they, they are inevitably better. 
um, and also they've got the better guiding hand. I mean, uh, John Nathan Turner, who I, I love dearly, wasn't really a fan of science fiction. Uh, he just wanted to get the show as much publicity, and he wanted the show to be good, obviously, but he wasn't a sort of, you know, I, sometimes I'd have to lecture him on things, you know, just give him a talking to you about that, not, not a bad way, because like, he's a producer, after all. Um, but just because he, that wouldn't be his priority. Um, so I think that's that, that the most important thing, really. One is the right, um, special effects, and uh, the, the writing is better. But I think there are elements of it. I prefer, for example, personally, um, the longer story. I can't quite get on with the 45-minute episode. It's a bit like, a, sometimes I think, at its worst, it's been like a 45 minute trailer. Everything's happening so quickly. There's no kind of exposition, no, you know, it's very funny and very wickedly written, but I do miss just a bit of exposition. But, but uh, generally, I think it, it's come back as a fantastic success, fantastic series. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose follow up from what Peter said, it's, it's interesting, it's like being down there in Cardiff, and it is the idea that everyone who writes it is a fan or watch the programme. And it's a prestigious thing to work on as well, which I, I guess towards the end of the original series, it wasn't something that you might highlight on your CV or something, but this is very much, people want to work on Doctor Who, and sort of like, you know, they want to have guest act, you know, great, fantastic guest cast on every episode, and it's a really, you know, they get directors who really want to do it. And lots of people have grown up with it in the UK as well. I mean, it's, it's just become a global phenomenon in the last couple of years, but it's very much part of British culture. And so people get very excited about it. It's something they grew up with when they were children. And being able to recreate sort of like childhood nightmares on screen for a new generation is, uh, is, is very exciting for them. Traumatised um, children. Absolutely. <laughs> pass it on. Because <laughs> um, I think all of us, all of us like, remember us, like, being frightened as children by some like, uh, by, by, by Doctor Who. But I suppose, yeah, that's really, it's interesting what, what, what people are just saying. I think by virtue of the fact that it's a single camera drama, so a lot more of the story is told visually, which means that you can have a story which is 45 minutes, which probably has got a similar amount of plot as an old four episode story, but in the classic series, you would have two character actors coming along, sort of like projecting, wearing different pastel colored robes, and then we hear about the galactic war and some, some, like, you know, some nice pseudo sort of like, here's the Shakespearean kind of dialogue. Now, you can have like a caption and then an amazing bit of CGI, and that will dispense with, you know, a 10 minute scene or whatever in the old series. So I can sort of see how the grammar of television has informed those kind of choices. But I suppose also, and I think Russell, I think, has talked about this before, about in the old series, they're much more cavalier about death. You know, the, the actual body count is <laughs> It's really quite high. And, and I think uh, my, my Dalek story had, had a higher death yeah. count than Terminator. <laughs> And I think not that they don't have so like you know so sort of like they, they don't have some sort of like you know perilous things happening in the new series. I think they're a bit we're a bit less cavalier about <laughs> having a room of people exterminated by the dark to see people just like die horribly. And that. So I think just because you know with, because you would if you do it with the kind of cameras and stuff you've got now, it wouldn't be shown so like at seven o'clock at night. You could sort of uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be a very different kind of program. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's, that's <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think that the, uh, interestingly, the way television was made, uh, uh, um, except for my last story, came to Man Rosani, where we had uh, a director called Graham Harper, who then went on to direct some of the, the new movies. Um, it was done in a very, it's a very extraordinary way that we used to shoot television. Uh, it wasn't, and what, the, what we've learned, learned now, I think, in TV is the way films are made, isn't it, really? Because we were multi camera in the studios, and uh, people would stand, we would come onto the set, and like five or six people would just stand there, talking, and then we'd go, quick, run, and then we'd all start to stand there, but, you know, with, in a high moment of tension, we'd, we'd suddenly all dash off again, and they'd do things like they'd go, doctor, look, <laughs> and then they'd cut to the door, it would then begin to open, and you look at it now, and you think, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> and then point at the door and go, look! And then it opens. But that, that's just the way it was done there. Yeah. It's, 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 so we've learned that, uh, as you said, there's a short end of film really in the last few years. Do you think it was easier to scare uh, uh, these children back then? When you speak to grown ups now, they always said that they were so scared of what to do when they were young. I don't know if it was easy. I mean, theoretically, it shouldn't have been so scary. I think yeah. it was just something that. It should be much scarier now, really. It probably is. 
I, I was very gratified when I, I had my the first sort of, uh, uh, child up uh, um, to, to meet me at uh, an appearance. You said they hid behind the sofa. I was desperate afraid they no longer did hide behind the sofa. But I think people just did. I mean, my sisters really did hide behind the sofa. And one, one little girl came up and uh, her mother said what she, what she did was she would sit down <clears throat> about half an hour before the programme started and sit there expecting, <coughs> waiting for Dr. Hume to start. And the moment the music came on, <coughs> she would leave the room. <laughs> and then she would come in about four or five times during the course of the half an hour, just stay for about 10 seconds and leave. And as soon as the end music started, she would come back in and sit down. So she actually saw no, none of the show at all. <laughs> and yet was still terrified. <laughs> Well, I got the part, I was 29, I actually started as And you think you also started, oh, and you were a very different doctor than the ones before you? I was, yes. Was that a conscious thing? You wanted to... I would, it wasn't my decision, I just happened to be younger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, it was a bit more love, maybe a bit more sensitive. Well, I just thought I could run faster down the corridors. <laughs> um, and um, I, I think that John wanted to change the image. And what, what, I, what I'm very happy about now is that at the time I seemed very out of place. Um, but in retrospect, from where we are today, with much younger doctors, I seem like I started a trend. <laughs> so I'm, I'm quite happy about that. I don't seem so out of place as I did when I was making the And also you already had a career. Maybe it's different when you're young and suddenly you're Dr. Who and... Yeah. You're well, I was, yeah, and I was able to, I was very fortunate when I left. I left after three years to get another job and move on from it. Which meant that I'd never really stopped being connected with it, because I didn't ever feel I had to, you know, distance myself from the shows. And you played with three different doctors? Yes, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so because like, my first episode was with David Tennant. I didn't have any scenes with him. But, uh, and, and I'm not sure, I was actually a cameo in his very last episode as well, where he bought me with a mallet. So my interactions with David were somewhat limited. Um, but then, yeah, I sort of like became slightly more of a regular with, with Match Doctor. And then obviously, sort of being in, um, being in two episodes with Peter, being Peter's first episode, and also, after seven years in the rubber suit, they gave me the reward of actually being allowed to have my own face on screen in the Christmas special, which was very nice. Um, but I had to wear an owl costume, so it's sort of random. Um, but, um, but yeah, so it's, it, it's interesting to see the different And of course, as well, I did big finish audios as well. So I think I've worked with all of the doctors who are yet living. So, um, <laughs> apart from Chris Rose. But um, uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's quite, it's nice really. I think, again, my, my seven year old self is doing car wheels. So it's, 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 uh, it's, yeah, it's good fun. Now, I want to ask you both about the big finish audio. Are you both done them? Uh, what's that like? And what do you think it adds to the Oh, well, I mean, certainly from the point of view of, so like, you know, Peter was my doctor when I was, when I was a kid, you know, I was watching him when I was, you know, four or five years old, and it was just real, and it was like, a, it was like some kind of documentary. Um, <laughs> but, um, and I was like, I think possibly the first one that I did was, um, I think the one with you, might have been <coughs> Segura, and I think it was that whole sort of thing of putting the earphones on, and then suddenly hearing the voices, because everyone, you know, obviously, you know, so time has passed and so I don't look quite how we did in 1982. But then, so like when, when I put the earphones on and heard so like the voices coming on, so it was kind of, I'm in an episode of Doctor Who. That would have been made when I was, <laughs> when I was a child. It was amazing. It was, it, was, it was very exciting. But I think it's, I think it's lots of stories that just it, it, it deepens and enriches the universe. So you know, there's sort of like the fifth Doctor could yet be the Sontaran and Sontaran. Yes, exactly, yeah. I think he has, hasn't he? Yeah. Uh, one thing, the only problem I have with the big finish things is that we do them, you know, within the space of two days. And um, then they ask you two months later, what did you think of that song? I can't remember it. <laughs> so uh, um, I, I can't remember, uh, you know, they say, which is your favourite big finish production? I have no idea. Uh, except other people tell me spare parts was very good, so I usually give that answer. <laughs> um, but I think they, they, they kept the programme going. Really big finish, and they were hugely uh, uh, involved in, well, not involved directly, but they were responsible for keeping the, the, the fans happy in that the fallow years. And then I think then Doctor, the actual Doctor Who proper BBC began to take an interest, and in now I think all the scripts have to be better by yes, and well, because I don't think that's a good thing or a bad thing. 
but I know it always, it always happens because uh, I'm being told, oh, we can't say that. We can't say that on a BBC would be happy. Um, but uh, so it's nice for them. I think they're, they're sort of definitely involved, but it's been upgraded. And you get some great stories as well. You know, and as Colin Baker says, the scenery is better on radio. <laughs> Spin-off with you, oh, Mesra yes. and Jenny going. Any news on that? The Parthenos, the Parthenos Gang spin-off. I, I, I don't know. I still haven't heard anything about it. I know that. I think that Stephen Moffat and Mark Gatiss are both kind of busy with writing <laughs> Doctor Who and Sherlock. That's a, that's a point, quite a lot of time. I think Stephen likes writing those characters. I'm not sure whether he would let anybody else write them. So. Um, it could be very Sherlockian thing. It could go. No, it could be. No, certainly no. I, mean, I think it definitely would be up for a special too. That'd be great fun. But I think it's. Uh, you know, I have a good 15 hour day when I'm in that rubber suit. So I think if we were doing a full series of nine months, so I think I would need a big industrial vat of moisturizer to just sort of like a prune at the end of it. So, uh, yeah. Alright, well, before we go to questions, um, I'm going to ask you about your project. Um, you've been working on about the sonic screwdriver being destroyed. John Nathan Turner thought it would become too universal. In other words, it could just get the doctor out of any problem at all. Uh, and indeed, that is the case. I mean, I do love the sonic screwdriver, but it is true that it seems to do everything. <laughs> um, so he just thought it would be better without it, and that the doctor's pocket should be full of odds and ends, bits of string, and things like that, and that they would be the things that he would use. But I kind of missed it. I was a bit sad when they blew it up. Um, yeah, but I think probably it, 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 it's difficult. It's a moot point, really. You could argue it, but whether it's it, it's beneficial or not, something neat about the doctor. But, but sometimes it's nice to think of different ways around problems. Okay, thanks. And I just want to let you know, I still have recurring nightmares for tomorrow. You do? Tomorrow, yes. I'll tell Janet that. She'll love that. <laughs> speculation about whether the classic doctors were going to be in the 50th anniversary special and we were asked this over and over again and in the end I just said well if we aren't I'm down I'm going to make my own <laughs> and, and it was a foolish remark <laughs> it was a foolish 
time because the very next event I went to, someone put their hand up and said, apparently you're making your own 50th anniversary special. And I thought, I I've got to do something now. So I sat down and wrote a little short five minute a little sketch really. And um, if they got a bit longer, then I asked Colin and Sylvester and Paul if they would be involved, and they said yes. And then um, um, Sylvester said, I, I can, I'd love to do it, but I do have to go away to New Zealand to film The Hobbit. And I thought, well, why don't I write a scene for Peter Jackson? And, 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 and just see if he'd be interested in doing it. So I wrote the scene, and we, I sent him on an email, and he came back and said, yes, I'd love to do it, and I'll get Ian McKellen in it too. So <laughs> it was like a rolling stone, really. The cast just got bigger and bigger. And everybody, with one exception, everyone I asked said yes. So <laughs> it was a bit like with Dan, you know, it, poor guy just had to be passing and something he was roped in. Um, so it just got longer and longer. There was some argument with the uh, producer of Doctor Who as to how long it should be, because I didn't want to cut anything. <laughs> I decided I'd be a terrible director, <laughs> especially of Doctor Who, because they kept telling me stories about how, you, you know, in the end, the poor director of Doctor Who directed all this marvellous stuff. And Producer comes along and says, "Cut it," yeah. uh, and uh, I wouldn't let them cut anything. And my 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 bravest moment was when um, uh, 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 the producer, Doctor Who, not Stephen, uh, uh, came to me and said, uh, "We'd like you to cut 12 minutes out of, uh, of it." And I said, "That's fine, but if 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 you make me cut it, I'll tell the fans." <laughs> <laughs> and magically, 24 hours later, he said, "Yeah, I think it's fine." <laughs> so this is the power you have, bear that in mind. I know the standard art marks will be Daleks because they're so iconic in terms of Doctor Who, but I rather liked the Cybermen in my time. I thought they were kind of neat. They had a very good chief Cybermen, David Banks. And um, I always thought they were kind of scary. They always looked like, like they could move and catch you. Whereas quite a few of the monsters in Doctor Who don't look like they can move more than about half a mile an hour. <laughs> and indeed, a lot of the time, you did have problems in Doctor Who because, you know, these poor, I felt sorry for the soldiers who would die. Uh, because you know, they, they were approached by this great rubber monster and they could just have walked away. <laughs> but instead they had to go, like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was on the side of the were pretty scared. And when I became an actor, I do remember this, um, you know, we have this thing called corpsing where you just get the giggles when you have uh, tense moments, you can't start laughing. I, I always used to remember a Cyberman scene from my youth. Uh, and it would stop me laughing immediately. So I was bringing back a trauma. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say something there. Um, I think I do like I do like the Daleks. I was pleased when they brought the Ice Warriors back. But one thing which I remember from when I was when I was little, watching Frontios, um, I remember the Tractators, and they weren't brilliantly realised. There was just something about this kind of like woodlock <laughs> with a human face on it. Actually, the concept of it, if they did it now, it would be absolutely terrifying. Actually, there are a couple of creatures in the old series, but the design is actually great. But the actual sort of conception of it wasn't sort of quite, um, wasn't quite there. But oh, well, if they ever brought the Rutans back, I think they could do that really well now. So you know, the big blobby jellyfish type thing that sort of the fight. Yeah, I think now there's, yeah, the, the, the moment is right. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, For me, it was my, my third, obviously not, not working on the program. I did a, um, after it was announced that I was going to be the next doctor, I went to a convention in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, quite a big convention at the Hotel Camelot. <coughs> Don't ever go there. Um, <laughs> and I, I remember the first, very first question that I was asked was about an incident that happened in um, a John Pertwee story, as if I was 
the doctor. <laughs> and I think that's when I realized it, it had uh, um, sort of permeated. It, it's a very, it's not thing, you get this quite often, where people, people sometimes think I'm a trained vet. Uh, uh, and so uh, it, I think I, then I realized that uh, this program is, is, is getting quite big, really, and this, obviously people are taking this very, very seriously. And indeed, over the years, I, I've never been to a convention where the fans haven't known more about the program than I do. Which brings the question, maybe you should all be sitting up here and I should be down there asking the questions. Um, but yeah, that was it, really. Oh, and that it was terrible. Actually, it was a, I did a convention that I was just just after uh, uh, John Lennon was shot. I went to a convention in America, and they said, um, "Have you ever worried that someone's going to assassinate you?" <laughs> 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 I mean, that, that has ruined my entire weekend. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose it's when, um, for me, when I was yeah, you know, I've, I've been in the program and sort of like you know, become a bit more established with tracks, but I don't suppose it was the 50th anniversary of this year, 2013, because that's the first time I went to the States, so I did a convention, and I think they were saying there that it was Gallifrey, which they have had about a couple of hundred people at for a best, the best part of 20 years, and all of a sudden, over the last few years, it just mushroomed, and I'd had to peak the cap the numbers at about 3,600, and that felt like a, sort of like a massive thing. But I think the moment when I support, yeah, Doctor Who's really quite a big deal now, is when I did the Doctor Who prom, and I sort of co-presented that along with the Macintosh and Peter was so I could part of it as well. And that was amazing, just standing on stage with 6,000 Doctor Who fans roaring and thinking, this is, this is big, isn't it? Because I did the very first Doctor Who problem, in May, which was in 2008, I think. And that was, that was brilliant organised chaos. But um, I think they've worked out slightly better how to do it. But um, <laughs> still, it's like being in the strap suit on the hottest day of the year um, with my, uh, my battle suit Un underneath the butler suit, had a quick change, nearly dying of heat stroke. <laughs> but it was quite, a, it wasn't just kind of, I think it was that visceral thing of actually seeing this huge auditorium full of 6,000 people, all just being absolutely crazy with Doctor Who. And the fact that it's basically, in Britain at least, it took over television. And with the um, 50th anniversary special, knowing that the little bit that I did at the start with Strax, like talking about cinema etiquette, pop card gives you a pee. And then sort of like, I think the BBC was surprised, that was shown in 96 countries worldwide. <laughs> that's okay, that's that. That's quite a lot of exposure in some ways, but still no one knows what I look like. So, <laughs> but it's, no, it, it, was, it was just something of seeing that, you know, Doctor Who's something come, and Peter and Jen are like going around and like going to South Korea. And it's just, it's just amazing that everyone in the world, even if they haven't watched it, know kind of able it is. So, yeah, it's a, it's a different, different time. Mm -hmm. Three to choose any part. Uh, yes, on the series, any part, any monster. Uh, oh, do you, uh, 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 but, so apart from playing the Doctor, yeah, another Doctor. Apart from the Doctor. That's too good. Instead of saying, the Tenth Doctor, I will be playing the Tenth Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that would be a wise place to go to. Um, I don't know. I mean, I would, I, I would love to, to uh, I'll never be in it properly. Obviously, because I, I was a doctor, and I don't look like I did when I was a doctor. So unless they figure out a reasonable way, which they kind of did, I did a short thing in Time Crash, uh, um, but then when they kind of explained why I was looking older and you know, uh, um, cratered. Um, but uh, uh, um, I don't think I'll ever find my way back into it. But it would be nice to actually be playing, to play a part of it. Maybe I could be in disguise. I'd be a taller sort of target. <laughs> uh, your own brother's suit. Um, I, I, I think I'd like, I'd, if not the Doctor, I'd definitely like to be a Time Lord with my own TARDIS. When I was a kid, I used to draw infinite things with like the TARDIS control room. The TARDIS at work? Yes, that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it.
this doctor. Is that the, the companion sat. Well, they become much more important. I mean, there's an argument that uh, I've heard and it's, that, in fact, the most important character, you know, when the series returned, the most important character in that first season was Rose, not the Doctor. Because, you know, for the first time, they found a way. I think they struggled for many, many years to give the companions a decent part. I mean, we had very strong people playing the part, you know, Sarah Jane, even my own uh, Tegan, but they didn't find a way to really write good parts for them, I don't think. Until Rose, and I think Russell G. Davis did manage to make that a, a, a brilliant character, and a character we just saw the Doctor through the companion's eyes, which they'd never really managed to before. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm, sometimes I wonder whether um, the companions become too important, I must admit. It's a, it's a balance which I think they, they got right, and sometimes they don't quite get it right. So it's almost more about the companion than there is about the Doctor, and I don't think that's quite right. But certainly, I think. I'm, I'm very pleased that they found a way to make the companions more important. And indeed, you know, they are, because what all the companion is saying really is what we might be saying. What are you doing? You know, a bit like in those, those films where the main character does something, you see when you're going, no, don't open the door! <laughs> is what the companion is saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> 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 what do It better be a good question, because we're all looking at you now. <laughs> Why did I pick on you? Why did I, pick on you? <laughs> I, I get into trouble with this because um, I, and it's really not, uh, I, I just feel that the doctor is an incredibly important role model for young men boys really and I think to, to change that around on a kind of whim of why not have, why can't we have a woman is it, I think it would be a shame. As I said just now we have and I know not all companions are, are, are women but they are largely and they've now got to a point where you have a really well conceived female companions. So I, I think I don't see the reason to change it really to be honest with you. I I, I just don't think they should be, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being sort of adamant about standing my foot. Personally, I think the balance now is you have a doctor, once you come, come back into the series, which I like to think I had it a bit brought back, is an element of self-doubt uh, 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 and uh, uh, vulnerability, which goes back to the question for the man on the back. Uh, um, so that you do need a companion who sometimes does have to guide the doctor, tell the doctor what to do. And if you reverse that, you have a female doctor going, oh, I don't know what to do, and the man going, you should be doing this, everyone would complain about that, wouldn't they? Uh, so I just personally think it, it, it's a good way. It's, it's a, I think it's a very important role model for, for men, for boys, and they sometimes need these good role models. So I don't, I don't think I've like seen a change. But then I, I'm not going to write letters to the BBC as they do cast them. And we now, of course, have set the precedent of changing sex with the master. Yeah. So uh, who knows what will happen? And I think, I think with Cheryl Gomez being cast on that, she's fantastic. But I think, again, it's, it's, someone, it's, it's a decision taken out of getting someone who's really, really good in that particular way. Yeah, yeah. Very good performer. So I think, yeah, if there, if there was like a motivation for it like that way, I think it would be like, not just right now we'll cast one because it's, because it's the right thing to do. But I think it has to be led by the performer or it's like the aesthetic. But, yeah. Very He's just confused by everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, there. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for both of you. I'm a huge fan of Big Finish. Is there anything that you specifically want to do in Big Finish? Um, well, I've actually co-written an episode which is coming out in September. So you should all listen to that. <laughs> I've written that with John Dorney, who's written lots of, lots of stories. And uh, I went the full Terror Sticks with the title. It's called Terror of the Sun Tower. So, uh, so, yeah, that's, that's what I think. Um, I, I don't know what I've done. I just I enjoy the excitement of getting the new script through the, um, through the door and then forgetting it two weeks later. <laughs>
No, they're good. They're great slides. Good stuff. Thank you very much, everybody. Give us a round of applause. Dennis Darkey and Peter Davison.